Today we want to have a closer look at what it takes to build a good GT3 car. So first of all, the GT3 category is very popular and racing at different circuits all around the world. The vehicles are based on production cars, look nice, sound different and because of a balance of performance provide close racing. And this is a customer sport category, which is very important to remember when you design such a car. So let's start with the car itself. You need a good base car. This car should have around 500 horsepower, rear wheel drive, good weight balance, low center of gravity, good base aerodynamics, low frontal area and low drag. If we look at the manufacturers, most of them have such a suitable base car. Ferrari has the 296, Mercedes has the AMG GT, Porsche the 911, Aston Martin the Vantage, Chevrolet has the Corvette, Audi has the R8, but since the introduction of the GT3 category, BMW never had a suitable car. Their cars were always either too small and weak or too large. You can learn more about this special situation at BMW and why it turned out like this in my other videos. So, if you have such a good base model and you can immediately start turning it into a race car, good for you. But if you start with a less suitable car, let's remember the Bentley project, and you have to reduce the car's weight by one ton first, completely redesign the front end and push the gearbox to the back to have decent weight balance, then it's a lot more expensive from the beginning. Because this is a business case for manufacturers. The next thing is the engine. Like we said, it's great to have a base engine that can already do 500 horsepower in the streetcar. Because you want to keep the complexity for customer teams at a minimum, until now, it used to be a good choice to have a naturally aspirated engine. So 500 horsepower for an, a naturally aspirated engine either means a big engine like the AMG GT3 or high revs like the 911. AMG even kept the older 6.2 liter naturally aspirated V8 of the previous car instead of using the 4 liter V8 turbo engine of the road car. Engines with large displacement offer lots of torque and because they pump out less horsepower per liter, the engine parts are not as stressed as in engines with high revs. But high revving engines are great to drive, have less torque which might be easier to drive in the rain for amateur drivers and these engines are smaller. And also here one example of BMW. They used the high revving V8 of the M3 in their Z4 GT3. But this engine couldn't reach 500 horsepower in the street version. And because it had smaller displacement and was already high revving, it was hard to tune it to 500 horsepower. It could never reach this and even a BOP couldn't compensate for all of it and they always had a top speed problem. I said, until now it was a good idea to use a naturally aspirated engine in your customer GT3 car because turbo engines are much harder to handle and adjust, especially for customer teams. If you run too little boost, you're losing out. If you run too much boost, you get disqualified. So it's hard to set up correctly and teams cannot do it themselves anymore. They need factory support. And that is adding complexity and costs. Not to mention that the engine bay is a lot busier, there are more parts and parts are harder to reach. But this is changing right now. Turbo engines provide a lot more torque in areas you want it, you can fine tune them and because of that boost, you can use smaller engines to have a better package. That means the old packaging problem of mid-engine cars, the gearbox hanging behind the rear axle and blocking a large diffuser, can now be solved. Ferrari's 296 has a short longitudinal V6 but a transversal gearbox behind the rear axle, which allows for a large diffuser. And because we talk about packaging, the 911 might be the only GT3 car that is a four-seater. That is possible because of its Beetle concept with the low-hanging engine behind the rear axle. That blocks a decent diffuser and results in a huge rear wing, which in return increases drag because a rear wing is less efficient than downforce through the underbody. Of course Porsche knows that and turned the whole drivetrain around for the RSR version, which unsurprisingly resulted in a huge diffuser and smaller rear wing. But back to the engine. Additionally, with turbo engines you can compensate BOP restrictions better. If you want to know more about that, check out my other videos with the links below. 
So right now GT3 cars like the Audi R8 and Lamborghini Huracan with their naturally aspirated 5 liter V10s are complaining that they don't have the torque to keep up with the new turbocharged GT3 cars. Another point on the engine is that it's beneficial to have a symmetric engine. So you have a symmetric thermal distribution and the sides of the car are equally stressed and you can spread the thermal load across a larger area. This can help you with better tire wear, but also with reliability of components in the engine bay and suspension. Tire wear is another important point. As this is for customer racing, you want your car to work on every track worldwide. The tires should be able to get to temperature quickly, but also last for long for less pit stops. Another point that is getting increasingly important is serviceability. Split lines around the car and assemblies should be designed wisely, so these cars can be repaired quicker. Important parts should be easy to replace. Also the amount of special tools should be limited and spare parts not overly expensive. Another important point for customer teams is that the car should be easily adjustable. So for example, there should be clear intakes for water and brake cooling that can be blanked easily. Also different gurney sizes are a good and cheap tool to set up a car. Also different gurneys are easier to handle than different wing angles. You need tools to measure that again and find the right holes. Another point is that these GT3 cars are often used for endurance racing. So drivers are spending lots of time inside the cockpit. So the seat should be comfortable, the buttons intuitive, driver change shouldn't be a drama and there should be a decent light for driving in the night. And pit stops are another important point. The fuel flap and air connector for the lift system should be easy to reach. Some cars have the air connector at the back, but then mechanics can bang their heads on the rear wing and sometimes deal with hot exhaust gas. Some GT3 cars have them at the sides, but then it depends on which side your box is at individual tracks. So designing a good GT3 car is not an easy task. The whole package has to convince customers. And we shouldn't forget that also the look of the car is important for teams to attract sponsors. If a GT3 car is overly complex, lots of smaller teams won't be interested because they might not be able to run the car. So the manufacturer is selling less of them. If the car is very expensive, it has to deliver results to justify the price, something that Ferrari has just done. And in general, BOP can level the fields, but you will still have a hard time if your base car is not suitable. So in the end, the manufacturer has to deliver a good package. Which one is your favorite GT3 car? Let me know in the comments below and check out my other videos for more.